Welcome to MOOC course on introduction to proteogenomics. In the last lecture by Dr. David Fenio, he were introduced to the concept of proteogenomics and its ability to provide expression level information at multiple levels. In today's lecture, Dr. Fenio will introduce you to few more capabilities of proteogenomics and its applications in various clinical problems. So, let us welcome Professor David Fenio for his today's lecture. So, one thing that people observed a lot in the uh, cancer genome atlas and in many um, uh, cancer genomic studies is that there are a lot of changes when you look in the either uh, whole exome sequencing or RNA-seq. Um, uh, it's and it, a lot of changes and it's difficult to say which changes are interesting, which changes are important. So, one thing that one can use uh, the, uh, the proteomics for is to focus in on the changes that actually have an effect on the, uh, on the proteome. Because um, I mean it really in general often does not matter if we have a, a copy number change that does not lead to any changes in the protein that is probably not so interesting than if we have something that actually changes the, uh, the, the proteome. So, uh, one thing that we can uh, then uh, look at is so this is from uh, the CPTAC. Uh, uh, breast uh, uh, paper, uh, we can look at when we have uh, consistent, uh, uh, we see consistency between the different measurements. So, this shows uh, copy number, transcript protein and phosphoprotein uh, and we see that uh, this is again for RBB2 here in on top. So, we see that usually when we have an amplification. So, uh, uh, a copy number change, we then also see that uh, the, the transcript levels are high, the protein levels are high and uh, a lot of the um, uh, phosphorylation levels are high. So, so when, we, when we see this consistency between the different uh, um, uh, data types, we can then we do see that uh, the uh, uh, RBB2 which is uh, well known to be an important uh, driver in a subset of um, breast tumors. Uh, so, that uh, comes out and then we see this for a few other uh, kinases where in, uh, in other samples like uh, uh, PAC1 for example also has this consistent and there are a few others. But that says so we can definitely focus on things where um, all the different data are correlated and uh, tells us the same thing. Uh, but uh, we will, if we only do that, that will be very uh, limiting. Uh, so we, uh, but that's one way to get started to see what are the uh, consistent things between different uh, uh, data levels. So. Um, Another thing is we can look at then uh, correlations between different genes. So, this is one example again RBB2 now comparing it to GRB7 and we do this both uh, on the DNA, RNA and protein level and this case we, we have very consistent uh, result they are highly correlated on all the measurements. And uh, so, the reason why we have the copy number uh, change so highly correlated is that they are very close to each other on the same chromosome. So, uh, this is uh, one example, but if we compare RBB2 to RBB4, we see that we have RBB4 does not have any copy number changes, uh, the transcript levels are not correlated, uh, but we have a, a rather high correlation on the protein level. Um, and this is uh, uh, quite common for proteins that work together. So, if we look at RBB2 in general and just uh, rank how in breast cancer uh, again, um, how which are the genes that are highly correlated with it now it is only on the uh, protein level we see that we have some high protein. So, these are the two that we looked at uh, GRB7 and RBB4. Uh, so, those are the two highest correlation, but then there are others that are highly have high positive correlations also 
and we have some that uh, have uh, rather high negative correlations. At least so this one is uh, minus 0 0.54 um, uh, correlation coefficient. Um, so uh, then we can start by looking at this we can start sort of uh, seeing uh, uh, which, what are the uh, sort of other play, uh, proteins that uh, each protein uh, works with. So uh, then, so we looked at, uh, so the question is what does this then mean? So we saw that for the simple thing was that on, if the, we see correlation on the copy number level, it's usually just that uh, we have, um, uh, that they're close to each other on the genome. So if the copy number of one changes, it's usually the copy number changes in a larger region. So then if they're close to each other, they will both uh, change. Um, but then it gets more uh, involved what we uh, can, and we saw then on the protein level, uh, we could have that if they were working together in a complex, um, they were regulated in the protein level, maybe by that um, the complexes are uh, formed and if there one of the uh, components is on its own um, and left over and it doesn't have anyone to pair with it gets uh, uh, degraded at a higher rate for example but there could be other uh, um, and but we see uh, also uh, correlations at the RNA level so so then we can start thinking about how do we uh, then use this uh, information. And one way to do it is if we have uh, a large enough experimental data set, we can uh, uh, start to see, uh, look at um, uh, networks and pathways to see how, uh, if we see any differences. So, uh, so for example, this is just one example where we have uh, three genes, A uh, will affect B, uh, A will affect C also, and C will uh, affect the phenotype. So uh, in this case, uh, we see that A will affect the phenotype through uh, C. So uh, if we then uh, inhibit C, we will also inhibit uh, the effect, so A now can't affect the phenotype. So if, there, if we have one subtype uh, of our tumors that um, have this uh, structure, uh, then we see that uh, uh, inhibiting uh, C would be a, a good way to, to change the phenotype, in this case um, uh, treat uh, the tumor. Uh, but if we have another subtype where we also have uh, a connection from B to the phenotype. Um, that will then uh, change things. So in this case, if we uh, 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 have a drug against C, uh, it will stop this pathway, but will still have uh, the other pathway uh, to. Um, so that's one thing that one can start thinking about when, uh, when one has these uh, uh, correlation data between different genes uh, on, uh, on different uh, levels. Um, so uh, then uh, we're going to talk a lot about uh, signatures and already now we've talked about uh, uh, different uh, signatures. So, so for breast cancer we have uh, the PAM50 uh, signature, which is uh, a, uh, uh, a set of 50 genes that uh, are used to uh, subtype um, uh, the, um, uh, uh, to determine the four uh, major subtypes of breast cancer. So here we just listed the different, uh, the 50 different genes, um, and we're looking just at the correlation between them. And then we see that and this is very common with signatures that we uh, select genes that are quite highly correlated but not perfectly. Um, so uh, we see these uh, regions of high correlation um, and then we see another group that's uh, 
uh, quite highly correlated within the, the group, but anti-correlated with the other group. So, they, some of the genes go up and down, and that's how we then build uh, a signature. So, so, the question is then, how do we get a signature? Um, so, Mani talked about uh, uh, unsupervised analysis. And uh, that's one way that we can try to uh, extract uh, uh, signatures. And there, as he mentioned, there are many different ways to do the unsupervised analysis. Uh, one example of it is uh, independent component analysis. And independent component analysis was initially developed uh, uh, for uh, if you have a room with several people talking, um, and uh, then you, you have a microphone, you hear um, an overlay of the different voices. And uh, so the, the, the whole point is to then um, separate out the different uh, uh, sources. And, and the way that it's uh, done is that we have uh, the, uh, the composite of all the sources and then we uh, separate them out so that we have uh, into two uh, matrices. One that would be the uh, signal source matrix and the other one is the mixing matrix on how to, to mix them. And, uh, and so we can do uh, the same thing for tumors and there the, the idea is that there are several biological processes that um, both basic biological processes that doesn't have anything to do with the cancer that we measure, but some of these uh, biological processes are um, related to cancer, but what we're measuring is uh, a, a, a sum of these different processes going on. Uh, so if we separate them out, so the first step is uh, completely unsupervised, so that uh, we, yeah, yeah, so these could be either the proteins uh, levels that we measure or RNA. Uh, we, could, uh, we could do it for, for either or we could even uh, combine it. And uh, yeah, so we're going to actually talk about that how in an analysis like this, how one uh, could uh, potentially combine both uh, proteins and, uh, uh, and the transcriptomic measurements. Yeah, so, so the, um, the, uh, so the uh, uh, signal source matrix are the uh, sort of signatures of uh, potential different biological processes. And then the mixing scores are how uh, large the effect is of each uh, of those signatures on the overall measurement. So, uh, yeah, so as I said, the first step is um, uh, then completely unsupervised, but then of course, since we both get uh, signatures from basic cellular processes and uh, of processes that are related to cancer, we will uh, then uh, go back and uh, look at which of these signatures are correlated to, um, to different clinical uh, data types. So, um, then uh, one example would be here. Uh, the uh, one of these signatures uh, are highly correlated to the luminal A subtype. And then what we see in that signature is that l there are a lot of uh, genes associated with uh, um, the cell cycle. Uh, and most of them are down. So this is the luminal A subtype to see that most of the genes are blue in this case, so they're down. So these cell cycle genes are much lower in this uh, signature. And this is actually a well known um, uh, signature of, um, uh, of luminal A. But we, we, we got it through an unsupervised analysis and then were able to uh, recover it uh, without uh, making any initial assumptions. And if we then look at these 
signature again, we just look at the correlation between the different genes in the signature, we again see the same thing that we have uh, most of the genes are uh, in this case positively correlated um, and but uh, there is quite a bit of variation and that is one thing that we have uh, uh, still variation between the genes, but they are uh, uh, quite uh, well correlated and then we have another group that is internally positively correlated, but then anti correlated to, to the rest. Um, so, uh, now we are going to another thing that we are going to talk about is how do we use this uh, for predictive modeling. So, uh, this is just a cartoon showing that uh, a patient here uh, who has uh, cancer can either be treated with treatment A or treatment B. And treatment A is preferable, uh, but at the time when we start the treatment we do not know. So, we definitely would love to have a um, uh, be able to do a measurement at this point and predict which of these two treatments um, are uh, would be uh, the best. So, um, uh, that is and for another person of course, it could be the opposite that treatment uh, B is uh, what would be uh, preferable. So, this is uh, one uh, 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 thing that uh, one example, but there are of course, a lot of other things we want to uh, predict and we are going to talk more on Saturday about how to do this prediction. Mani talk start introduced it, but we will talk in more depth about it. And the biggest problems with this kind of analysis is um, the uh, that uh, we can have bad luck if we do not have enough samples especially which we almost never do. Uh, we can just have random matching um, and uh, uh, that will give us uh, then predictive models that only work for um, the, the, the patients that we trained it on and not generalize. Um, and the other serious thing is uh, uh, bias. So, uh, the for for the to treat the, uh, the random uh, variation, there we have quite well established method as already Mami started introducing, um, but for uh, bias is actually a very uh, uh, problematic uh, uh, thing because one and one really has to be very careful because all these um, when we build these predictive models, we use uh, machine learning algorithms that we train. So, and they will only give us back um, the answer to what the kind of data we use to train them. Um, so, if we uh, choose uh, the uh, the control uh, uh, samples, for example, in the uh, wrong way, then that's. Uh, um, then it will not give us something that uh, generalizes. And this is uh, the bias especially is um, really problematic and one uh, should spend a lot of time on trying to, uh, to think about that. Today you learned that how proteogenomic analysis could provide you very useful and novel insights. In addition to providing RNA to protein correlation, the proteogenomics can also provide information on the association between two or more genes or proteins. The network and pathway analysis can provide information on how the presence of a protein or gene influences the expression of other protein or gene. A comprehensive understanding on the concepts such as predictive analysis, pathway enrichment, mutation and signaling as well as market selection will help you appreciate the role of proteogenomics in accelerating clinical research. Thank you.